you've got to unmute yourself. But uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's events. Uh, tonight, we are doing uh, Starting a Family Garden. Um, I'm Josh from the Orange County Library, um, and I've been bringing you guys um, adult events and family events uh, throughout the, the summer and through quarantine. So um, we have tons of great stuff coming up, but uh, tonight's event is absolutely no exception. Uh, today we have uh, Caroline from Fleet Farming, uh, and she's going to be showing us uh, how to start up a garden with your family and bring a lot of great events. Uh, I'm going to bring Caroline on now to uh, explain a little bit about Fleet Farming, but they're such a cool organization. I've had a lot of great friends come through there, so uh, and they're doing some awesome stuff for the community. So if you guys wouldn't mind welcoming Caroline. Um, uh, hello. Hi. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Josh. So I'm so excited today to be sharing um, Starting a Family Garden with Fleet Farming. Um, Fleet Farming is an urban agriculture program of Ideas for Us. Ideas for Us is an environmental nonprofit um, based here in Orlando, but we have 11 branches, including branches in Africa, Europe, and Asia as well. And um, what we do is we do environmental action every single month. And one of the things that we started in, Orla in Orlando that we've been leading is fleet farming. So I'm gonna be speaking about starting your family garden. Absolutely, thank you so much, Caroline, for coming out tonight. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you. Um, I just wanna let everyone know if you guys see, oh, we've already got some comments coming in who love fleet farming, so, or <laughs> fleet farmlet. Uh, so uh, you got some uh, customers already, but if you guys have any questions or comments throughout the event, please post those into the, uh, the YouTube comments or the Facebook comments, we'll see them all and we'll uh, we'll ask Caroline either after the program or throughout. So uh, thank you so much for coming and uh, I'll give it up to you. Thank you. Awesome. So we'll get our screen here ready with our presentation. So um, as I mentioned, Fleet Farming is a program of ideas for us. Ideas for us is such an amazing um, nonprofit that um, we do a lot of different types of things. Um, really, we focus all of our actions on food, water, waste, energy, or ecology. Um, we lead environmental events um, called the Ideas Hive, which is a think and do tank every single month. And we do an eco action project. So we might do something like a solar workforce training program or create a community garden, lead a waste audit, um, lead a native landscaping or shoreline restoration project, or even um, large scale tree plantings. So all of these different types of events are offered by Ideas for Us. So if you're interested in any of these, please join our community. You are totally welcome. We have memberships available and we have um, free events as well that you can come and volunteer in. Um, you can check out the Ideas for Us Facebook page if you want to check that out. Um, fleet farming is basically how I got started with the nonprofit. And we have three different parts of our program. The first one is Fleet Farmlets. I already see Maggie Finley on this, which is one of our um, Fleet Farmlet hosts. And um, basically the idea is that we turn the average American lawn into a productive micro farm or a farmlet. And um, it's part of a sharecropping model where the crops on site are shared with the homeowner and also sold at the um, Audubon Park Farmers Market through CSAs and given through donations. So um, that is the main part of our program. We also have an edible landscaping service called Edible Landscapes. So if you're interested in having a, a raised garden bed or fruit trees um, installed into your landscape, um, we welcome you to check out our service. We do all the whole thing um, from consultation, which is free, all the way until um, the completed project. And we even offer maintenance and education going forward. And then that brings us to fleet education. Um, through our programming, we've been able to create over 17 school gardens, which is um, a feat for us. And we're so proud of that. And through that, we've been able to do tons and tons of classes for children, elderly, um, people with disabilities, um, even uh, have led a veterans garden before. So um, this is just part of it. So you're experiencing fleet education right now. So we want to share information to empower you to grow food. So this is basically our vision is to take, you know, the average American lawn, something that isn't really being utilized and to create a poly um, diverse uh, growing system, either in ground, in raised beds, in fruit trees, um, to really empower people to grow their own food and to use this as a resource. And this is just more information about edible landscapes, about the different things that we offer. So let's get into the class, starting a family garden. 
So what does a family garden look like? Um, to me, it's a place where we can connect with nature. It's a place where we can grow food, we can give back to the earth, we can learn, we can grow. A place in our yard, as small or big as it might be, where all members of the family kind of have their own space for themselves. Um, and this can look like a bunch of different um, versions of a garden, whether it's native landscaping or edible landscaping, or maybe something a little bit in between. So I thought of some ideas. I was thinking, how can we get family members to engage in the garden, no matter what your age is? And um, here are some things that I was brainstorming and thinking about. Um, and we'll get into a little bit about all of this during this class. So pollinator gardening, supporting birds, composting, growing food, backyard camping even, and collecting rainwater. These are all ways um, that family members can be engaged into the garden. Um, it's something that's living and breathing and that you're learning from every single day. And so whenever you have more interactive parts of the garden, um, I feel that it creates a sense of responsibility and a sense of um, connection with our Earth, really. And that's what um, our gardens really are, is a little slice of planet Earth, right? So the first thing I want to talk about is pollinator gardening and raising butterflies. So this is something that I actually got into over quarantine. Um, it's a topic that's really interesting. Um, I learned that only 10% of the monarch butterflies actually make it to adulthood. And the reason why that is, is because of habitat loss and um, other environmental factors, but also because of predators. Um, uh, a host of different animals like to eat the eggs and the actual caterpillars. So whenever you can raise them at home, it's a fun way that you can be involved with your garden. Um, but also you can uh, give back and be raising these butterflies. I've raised over a hundred in my yard um, just this summer. Um, it's usually in the summer months. I think they it's set online from March to July, um, but I would say a little bit past July. Um, if you're planting things like the um, tropical milkweed, which is uh, a big topic of debate, um, you want to cut it back in the winter months because um, it is not good for the monarch butterfly because they're supposed to be migrating um, in that time. So if you want to learn more about that, that's definitely something to research that I'm still learning about. Um, but with pollinator gardening, I really want to bring up the Florida Native Plant Society. Um, they are an awesome organization. They are the experts in growing um, native plants. And I also have a resource on here, floridayards.org. They have this awesome um, plant database where you can basically put in the information of your event, or, or I'm sorry, of your yard, and it will tell you what plants that are native that you should be planting. And you can even type in things like um, wildflowers and shrubs or trees. So it's a really awesome resource to look out for. And also to remember that pollinators aren't just butterflies and bees. They're, you know, um, not just the honeybee, at least they're native bees as well. There's also wasps and different animals, like even possums are considered pollinators because they're going from flower to flower. Um, and raising butterflies, basically the idea of that is to grow native milkweed. Um, if you're growing tropical milkweed, you can do that. They do really like it, um, but you might wanna do some more research. To grow the milkweed, on the back of the milkweed leaves, you'll find little eggs that you can collect and put in a little, um, like on the screen, you'll see a box which has uh, some screen around it. This is a butterfly box. And you can put the leaves in there um, as the eggs hatch and turn into caterpillars. You can feed them leaves every day. You can have live plants in these areas. As long as a plant is getting water and sunlight, it will continue to grow in these boxes. And um, the caterpillars will crawl up to the top. They'll kind of um, make a J shape and they will turn into their chrysalis. And within, um, I'm not sure quite how many days, maybe, a little less than a week, um, they will turn into a butterfly. And when it becomes a butterfly, you can tell if it's a male or female, which is fun for the family to get involved with, you know, the whole process of raising butterflies, but also in um, uh, recording how many males and females that you're raising. So this is a really fun topic. And if you want to talk more about this, um, I would love to talk with you. You can email me at info at fleetfarming.org and I can share my experience. And um, so this is a fun way to get people involved with the garden. Um, it's not so much right now in the year, but in the summer. 
and some native plants to check out. I definitely, definitely, definitely would recommend that you plant some native plants in your yard. Um, we're losing habitat, so it is very important. So tick seed, black-eyed Susan, um, which is a vine and a, uh, a, free, uh, a plant, um, passion flower, milkweed, firebush, and cassia are just some of the butterfly and pollinator-friendly plants that you can plant. But of course, Florida Native Plant Society is the experts, and they know all about that. So this is just to get you inspired. The next thing is supporting local birds. So when we're talking about starting a family garden, um, this is another interactive piece. So this is something to um, really bring people, give people a reason to go out into the garden, right? They're gonna refill the bird feeder. They're gonna kind of see if there's something um, living in the birdhouse. And um, so here's some ideas. You can put up a bird feeder. Um, some bird feed will have things like candied fruit, which I've heard is not so good for the birds. Um, you can opt for more um, native bird seed varieties. Some things that I know that they like is sunflowers, um, nyer, um, cracked corn, millet, etc. cetera. Um, but every bird kind of prefers a different diet. So you might wanna look up a bird that you're trying to attract. On the screen here, I have the beautiful hummingbird here at the top, um, which is attracted by lantana, firebush, sage, cuphea, hibiscus, and um, flowers that are more trumpets shaped typically. Um, and they feed in the morning is when I've seen these types of birds. Um, I used to be a caretaker at beautiful Nearling Gardens, which is a botanical garden in Gotha, Florida. And um, in the early, early mornings, I would see the hummingbirds. And this is, a, I think this is a ruby-throated hummingbird. Um, below it is a Carolina wren, probably my favorite bird um, because they hunt spiders. And um, they're really smart, really smart birds. Um, Below that is, of course, the red cardinal. And to the left of that is a painted bunting. This is a painted bunting male. The female will be green and um, yellow. So I think this is a really great um, addition to your garden and you'll see a lot more life. This is just a fun idea for kids and um, for getting people outside at nighttime. So setting up a tent and having a little backyard camping day, you can listen to the sounds of nature, you can stargaze, explore the garden at night, um, whether that's with flashlights or not. And um, even nighttime movies in the garden, um, this is a fun idea where you can put up a little projector and have some time outside. Again, connecting with nature in a different way. Um, and collecting rainwater is a whole topic, a whole topic that um, I encourage you to research because, you know, we're living in Florida and we're using so much water from our aquifer every day, right? We're pumping up that water for our showers and brushing our teeth, et cetera, when we could be harvesting our rainwater and reusing it. Mind you, um, when you're thinking about rainwater, it's good to think about the water quality. So if you're collecting water just off of the roof, you're going to get everything that's on the roof as well or in the gutters. And um, I have heard that things like E. coli can be in these um, rainwater systems. So maybe you can um, do something like uh, using a charcoal filter. Um, there's so many tutorials online about setting up a rain barrel um, and also thinking about gravity. So having it um, in that first picture, you'll see it's up on the cinder blocks. And that's what's helping the water to flow down um, to the separate barrels. But also when you hook up the hose, it, the gravity is helping that um, to create some pressure to use it in the garden. Um, also, rain gauge is a fun way to be more interactive in the garden. Um, my friend has uh, <laughs> done a little bit of um, tracking of the rain and he has tracked it over, I think it was 36 inches of rain recently. So it's been raining so much. And um, so this is a great opportunity is to do some rainwater um, collecting and even make making your own rain barrels out of these blue barrels or something common that I see in the Florida gardens. So the next thing is composting and growing food. This is what you knew Fleet Farming was going to talk about because we love growing food. Um, it's something that we want to encourage more people to do. And I've broken down this into a couple different sections. So deciding your type of growing system, um, doing a little site survey, prepping the land, prepping the site, seeding, planting, har maintenance, harvesting, and a little bit of fun extras, because why not? 
So this I find is really inspirational. So this is a garden for small spaces. Just because you have a tiny, tiny yard or maybe a balcony doesn't mean that you can't have a garden. I know my I have a very small yard, um, so I do a lot of um, container gardening as well. And, you know, as long as the containers are filled with um, fresh soil, um, maybe you're um, purchasing soil from a local um, nursery maybe some compost, um, mushroom compost or compost that you make at home. We'll learn about compost in a little bit, but as long as you have really good compost and somewhere for the water to exit, right? So holes in the bottom of these containers so they can drain out because whenever we get all of this Florida rain, you know, it's gonna need to get out of there or it'll um, drown the plants, um, but it can create a really beautiful garden there's things that are being upcycled in the, these pictures like the pallets like the cinder blocks and really using every space that you have um, other systems are in ground on the left hand side which this is how we do a lot of our fleet farms whenever we um, convert lawns into um, our micro farms we do it in ground and this is like traditional um, agriculture um, because of the, a lot of the tools that we use it needs to be more accessible than in a raised bed um, but on the right hand side this is um, one of our raised beds that we built as well um, this is a cedar raised bed and it it can have a lot of benefits of having um, it in this type of growing system because it's raised off of the ground which can um, be helpful in kind of preventing some weeds from getting you know kind of sloshed into there by um, rains etc um, it's away from the ground so maybe you have less pests uh, but it's really aesthetically beautiful and it's clean and i really like that personally um, and then there's permaculture so i encourage you to research Orlando permaculture, they are the permaculture experts. And one of the ideas of permaculture, because it's a lifestyle, there's more than, it's more than just gardening, right? Um, but one of the ideas that they have is creating systems where plants are supporting each other. And in this case, creating like a forest of food where there's different levels of edibles, either they're sprawling on the earth or they're climbing up a tree or they're, you know, trees, smaller shrubs, um, et cetera, that are more perennial. Um, or maybe you have some biennials, meaning that you'll have you'll grow them um, twice a year. And um, so this is a different type of growing system where it's more um, it can be more relaxed. Right. It can be more of um, an ease and maintenance. And some plants that are used commonly in these types of systems are things like Moringa, which is an edible tree, um, banana, cassava, yucca, um, Okinawa spinach, New Zealand spinach. Um, uh, mango, mulberry, using logs as um, areas that are catching some water and helping with the structure and feeding into the soil, and even um, the chop and drop method, which that basically means that um, you're going into the garden, you're building up the earth by chopping and dropping certain plants and letting the composting system happen just like it would on a forest floor. So check out Orlando Permaculture if you're interested in that kind of growing system. So the first thing that I would say is to observe. We need to observe um, our environment. We need to see, is it sandy? Is it loamy soil? Um, what is the water like? Are there certain areas of your yard that is super, super dry? Are there certain areas that are always a little bit moist? Um, because we can use this in growing, right? Things like bananas might like a little bit more water. Um, things in a drier area, um, we might want to add some drip irrigation to a garden in, in one of those places or plant something that can do with a little bit less water. Um, so this is very important. Also, um, you know, checking out the wildlife in your area, it would be a shame for you to take out that one bush that has that bird nest in it or you know uh, the flowers like the Spanish needle that is usually commonly known as a weed. Um, it has uh, white flowers with like little yellow centers. Um, it's also called Biden's Alba, but it's actually a native um, Florida plant that pollinators love. So maybe observing nature and kind of keeping the things that are benefiting um, other organisms. Also having access to a water source I've seen gardens where people have put them way too far away from where they would um, have the water to access it. And, um, the, you know, the gardens kind of fall by the wayside. So making sure it's a high traffic area that you're frequenting so you can have that relationship with your yard, um, hopefully every day, hopefully every day. 
Um, the next thing is structure. So you can have your raised beds or your in ground. With the raised beds, I just put some things on here just as an inspiration as well. Um, I always love seeing people with gardens that have the logs that are, you know, thrown out on the side of the road um, on, you know, yard waste day. I love seeing people who have taken those logs, created their own raised beds out of them, filled them with them with soil and planted in them. It's just a really good idea because those logs are breaking down. And yes, you might have some additional ants in your garden, um, but I think that the soil, um, the soil building qualities and reusing these materials is a good thing. Um, you can also have um, mulch, mulch between the pathways can make it so then you have less weeds and that you have like little pathways to walk around in the garden. Um, you can leave it grassy. So there's so many different structures of your garden, but I would say it kind of goes to either in ground, like an in ground pollinator garden um, or a raised bed garden that you might want to grow some vegetables in. Um, also an idea is an orchard. So sometimes I, I talk to people and they say, I don't have any gardening experience. Everything I grow dies. Well, you know, one thing that is really great is fruit trees. And um, fruit trees, they need a little bit more attention whenever you first plant them, right? You're gonna plant the whole, you're gonna dig the hole three times as deep as the root ball of the plant is what I've been told. And then fill it back with that soil that um, is original to that area. Maybe add some compost and soil amendments, um, but researching your plant, of course. Um, but after you water it in, maybe for the first couple of weeks, um, that tree should be able to have less maintenance um, going forward, um, besides maybe an annual trimming, um, depending on the fruit variety. So fruit trees are great. And something like a banana is so easy um, to take care of, and it has a really big reward um, certain times of the year. Um, also, as an idea for structure. So on the left hand side, I see this as more like a permaculture design where you have your farms that you frequent more um, more often, closer to the house. And then on the outer skirts, things that you don't have to worry about as much. And then it flows to the outer, outer skirt of the uh, garden area being things that you don't really touch. You let it be wild. You know, you let the Florida um, forest be in, the, in your backyard. So either on a big or small scale, you can kind of imagine that in your yard. And on the right hand side, I love this image because it's really taking um, every inch of space that this person had and using it for growing food. And it just looks so clean and organized. They're using garden trellises, raised beds, um, even some gravel, which is an expensive choice, but um, it's, it looks really great. Um, so imagining where your garden can be, thinking about sunlight, thinking about um, uh, how big cer certain plants are going to get. When you think about like watermelon or pumpkin, those things are going to get big. They're going to sprawl and they're going to go far and wide. So maybe putting it on the edge of your garden near a little field and letting it go free in that direction. So let's talk about soil. So um, if you are not currently composting, I totally recommend you and challenge you to co start composting before the end of the year. Um, the reason for this is that a lot of our food is wasted. So it's wasted through our um, the food system that we currently have. I believe it's I might be wrong. The statistic: forty percent of our food is wasted um, through you know the transportation and um, the handling of it. Um, even just, you know, us buying produce and having it go bad at home. Um, but something also to think about is the scraps that we have from our fruits and vegetables and our more natural things that we eat. Um, this can be broken down into create really, really great compost. And when it's sent to the landfill, the landfill is so toxic that these um, food items that you would think like a banana peel would just naturally be able to break down, the toxic environment of these landfills don't allow for that system to naturally work. So um, it, this can be a really fun and um, uh, interactive part of your gardening and your daily life where you can collect these food scraps. Um, some people like to put them in the freezer and um, so then it's not smelly. They can just put a bucket in there and let it get filled up and then maybe at the end of the week, dump it into their composter. And some people like to just add things to their composter every day. But the basic idea is you have your browns and your greens. Your browns are things like that are already dead, like leaves and twigs and sticks and hay. Um, and your greens are things like your food waste, things that maybe have a little bit more life to it, like your grass clippings, um, 
and again, your food waste. So that balance of dry and wet mixing together with heat and with air and all of that together will create beautiful soil. And a lot of people, um, they till it together. And I like to think of it like a lasagna. This is what I tell with my kids, a lasagna of browns and greens. So uh, making sure that you're not just putting your food scraps, you can even put other soils into your composters to help start the process up. And I have some resources on the next page. So here's some ideas for composters and what this actually looks like and what this means. So you can have composters that touch the ground, like the first and second photos. This allows for the worms to come up and to help you in the breaking down of these um, of this plant material. And um, other insects as well can help to be decomposers in the process. Um, in these systems, um, air can get in and you can even till it um, with a shovel. Um, or a hand trowel to make sure that it's kind of breaking down a little bit faster. The third picture is of a vermiculture system where you're raising your own worms. Um, I teach a bunch of kids classes. Um, I'm a homeschool teacher when I'm not working full time for the nonprofit. And I love bringing um, my worms to class and talking about um, vermiculture with the kids because it's just fun and it's something that you can see in the garden and you can make the connection in your mind oh these worms are helping to break down the food food becomes soil and you can see that process happening and worm castings are probably one of the best things that you can amend your garden with um, and one of our resources that we have is O-Town Compost in the area. If you have any soil questions, please reach out to them. They also have a really awesome um, part of their program where they can pick up your food waste and turn that into soil. Um, so check them out, O-Town Compost. It's a really great price for um, all of the things that you get and the service of someone doing that for you. You know, and it feels really good to have all of that be going to a, a good cause. And they donate the soil as well to local nonprofits like Fleet Farming and our um, community gardening programs. Um, I'm going to um, just look at a question really quick here. Um, advice for growing ideas when you know, um, when, you when you get rats in your garden. Um, so I haven't really had any personal problems with rats. Um, when I lived at the Botanical Garden, we had like, a, you know, some mice in the garden that were part of the natural system. Um, but what I would say is if you have rats and it's an issue for you, um, maybe you can do a composter like the one on the far right side. This is a tumbling composter. I have this composter. I will say I prefer composters that touch the earth because, you know, you can get the insects involved in the um, decomposition of the soil. It does take a little bit longer, I think, in the tumbling composter, but it's great because it has that door. You can close the door, you can put all your food scraps in there and um, turn it. So that's fun for kids too. You can turn the composter every day to help get the air and help incorporate it. And um, rats will be able to get into a system like this. Um, other parts of your garden, um, that's a whole different story with rats that I'm not quite sure of how to um, how to solve that. But if anybody has any ideas about rats in your garden, you can um, put it in the comments below. Maybe it would help to encourage an ecosystem and attract snakes to your garden if you're into that. Um, so that's an idea, but I'm not sure, quite sure about um, other types of ways to prevent rats from your garden. The next thing I want to talk about is soil amendments. So there's so much to soil amendments. And when you have to think about this, um, you have to know what's really going on in the soil in the first place to be able to add the right things, right? Um, you can get a soil test from your local um, IFIS extension agency. Um, they have soil testing of pH, I believe. And there's uh, even other tests where you can get like the macro and micro nutrients um, tested in your soil. Um, someone who I would like to recommend y'all to look into is Revival Gardening. They create awesome worm castings. Um, their worm castings are next level. They feed their worms such a rich diet of different sorts of amendments. I know meal is one of them, um, but a, a host of different things that makes it really, really great for your garden. So I think worm castings is an all around great thing to add, but everyone's soil is different. 
Um, some other ideas, um, Indian River Organics is an awesome local company as well. Um, they have something, uh, they have a fr fish fertilizer, um, but they also have a kelp meal fertilizer. Kelp meal, I've heard, is awesome, awesome for your garden. Um, bat guano. So bat guano is, you know, the droppings of bats, and it has been proven to be really uh, great for some gardens. Biochar, we have a video with Fleet Farming on our um, YouTube that talks all about biochar and how the process works, and it um, can help plants to uh, have the accessibility to nutrients in the soil, I believe. And there's just so much to learn. So revival gardening, their worm castings are awesome. Um, but definitely when you're planting your garden, think about giving the garden a little bit of oomph, right? A little bit of extra nutrients so then they have everything that they need to grow. So I would definitely look into um, kelp meal, biochar, worm castings, and um, yeah, I think those are the favorites. Um, so soil. So I have this part of my yard, I want to start a garden, or my raised bed needs to get revived, what do I do? The first thing I would say is to kind of break up old roots that you have in your garden. There is a no-till method of gardening, um, but this can be helpful if you have things like um, pioneer species, which is a nicer way of saying weeds, because you know weeds are just a, a term for plants that we don't know. Um, but breaking up those old roots and kind of like incorporating the soil, kind of seeing what's going on, giving it a little bit of air and a little bit of life. Um, adding some leaves or organic matter to break down into the soil, adding your amendments at this time, any sort of worm castings or compost that you've created. Um, if you want, you can add something like perlite to help it drain if you're having drainage is issues. Um, and on the top, if you want to get real fancy, you can add something called coconut coir. Um, coconut coir is like um, this fibrous coconut material that you can add to the top. It kind of acts like peat um, where it can help um, the seeds to have readily available to um, moisture at the top of the soil. Um, and with pots, it can be as simple as just filling it up with some new soil ready to go, um, making sure that there's draining holes at the bottom. And something that's commonly used, I've seen a lot in um, permaculture and other systems, is using cardboard and mulch. Mind you, get cardboard that doesn't have any ink on it, it doesn't have any tape on it, um, but you can use cardboard to put down over grass um, with mulch on top of it to help create some pathways. Um, the mulch can be free if you go to, um, or if you call your local tree company, they usually will have a program where they can come and deliver you free mulch. Um, so just call your local um, uh, tree service and um, I would ask for clean mulch, mulch that's not from any diseased trees, um, but that's a good way of, again, um, creating more of a closed loop system and using something that is kind of a waste, which is cutting down trees and trim, tree trimming and putting it back into the earth and back into our gardens. And this can also help in preventing weeds. So this can help prevent, or this pioneer species being a better word, um, and it can help to um, break down over time. Irrigation. So you know, right now we're not really seeing that many problems with irrigation. It's almost like we have too much rain at this point, but um, it's not going to last for long in Florida, right? So um, it's good to have an irrigation system that's reliable. I really like for my own home garden um, to have a timer. So you'll see in the first picture, this is an irrigation timer. Um, if you see at the top, there's a little Y connector piece. Um, this is on there so then we can have a timer on one side and the other side we can have a hose. So we can use both of those separately. You don't have to take the whole system off to just use the hose whenever you want. Um, and the timer is really awesome. They're usually about $30 and um, the timer is connected to a hose as well. Um, it can be connected to a drip irrigation system. Um, we do have information on our website under garden resources if you want to watch our video on uh, drip irrigation. Um, or, um, this is what I use for my garden, I have the timer hooked up to a hose into a sprinkler. So you'll see that sprinkler on the far um, right side, and this can help, so then it's on a, a set schedule every day, and it can help you to water your garden without you having to wake up at 6 a.m. to water it, because um, early in the morning is, is usually the best time to water your garden. Um, and uh, also, I have a picture here to just show that if you're not using any type of system, you're just gonna hand water. Um, get to know your garden soil by just putting your hand in there and seeing is it dry or is it moist. 
Um, that's, you know, how people have to been able to tell over centuries. So it still works. Um, I do have a question. Can you successfully grow um, different colored bougainvillea in Central Florida? Yeah, I've seen people grow so many different colors and kinds of bougainvilleas. Um, bougainvilleas, um, they are a woody vine that is uh, a little bit thorny and it has these um, flower brackets, I believe, um, that have little tiny white flowers, but colorful um, uh, other flower parts. And um, I've seen them in yellows, oranges, purples, pinks. They can get a little bit crazy. Um, I believe they're not native to Florida. Um, and there's something that you do have to prune often. Um, but if you like them, you know, why not, I guess. So um, yeah, you can grow different colors of bougainvillea in Florida. Um, but I would check out some Florida natives, check out some passion flower vines or some um, coral, some coral vine or some really cool ones that um, our pollinators love. Um, and the next thing I want to talk about is seeding and planting. Right now is the time to start your family garden. It's a really great time. You, as you can tell, um, I, I could tell about a week ago, um, it started to get cooler. And it's exciting because now we can grow some fun things. We can grow broccoli, kale, carrots, lettuces, um, including arugula, tomatoes, eggplant, beans, peas, potatoes, beets, um, all of those different types of crops. Um, I'll even add some of the summer crops that can continue on as well. This is the time that we're harvesting our watermelons and our pumpkins around this time um, that we grew a little bit um, earlier in the year, um, in the summer um, to late summer time. Um, but it's really great right now because our leafy greens have enough cooling time that they can actually grow without getting, you know, sunburned, basically. And there's other plants that can grow all year long, like your fruit trees are going to continue are going to continue to grow. Um, your perennial spinaches, um, herbs, pineapple, all of those things will continue as well. We're so lucky in Florida because we can really grow all year long. Um, we don't have that winter time of um, rest. And here's some um, seeding arrangements that I would suggest. Um, we have more of this on fleetfarming.org slash, um, uh, I think garden resources, we have this, but these are some combinations. And some of the combinations that I share are like basil, um, tomatoes, and marigolds. They are part of a companion planting system. So companion planting, it's kind of like a folk science. It's kind of things that have been passed down from generation to generation. There is science on it if you wanna look that up. Um, but some plants just go great together. And it's funny that tomatoes and basil go well together because in Italian cooking, they go really well together. The middle picture is of herbs. So if you wanna create an herb garden, these are some things that grow great. Parsley, thyme, cilantro, onions, rosemary, Cuban oregano, lemon balm, green onions. Um, things like mint will go a little bit crazy. I have my mint in pots because they do like to spread very fast. Um, and that third picture is eggplant, um, oregano, marigolds, bush beans, and peppers. If any of this sounds great to you, I'd love to hear. Um, I'd love to hear any specific questions as well about um, our vegetables. If you have any questions at all from any of this, please put it in the comments and I can do my best to connect you with a local resource or answer it myself. And some nurseries, so you might want to take a picture of this right now. Um, some plant nurseries that are really great, and we love to support our plant nurseries. Um, they're usually family-owned businesses. Um, they usually have a cat on site, which I love. And um, they're just really great plant people. So South Seminole Farm and Nursery, Lucas Nursery, Biosphere Nursery, Palmer's Nursery, Green Owl Gardens, Appenberry's Nursery. Um, and there's a couple more as well. Um, Fleet Farming, we're actually having a big plant sale. Um, we're having a plant sale on, I believe it's on the Saturday, October 24th. And um, this is going to be a huge sale where we're going to have a lot of the plants that I talked about today, um, some of the perennials that can last all year long, and um, some of the uh, crops for the fall season. So please be sure to join us for our um, plant sale. You can find that at, on our Facebook page under the events tab. So please, you're invited. But in the meantime, and even after a plant sale, we encourage you to support our local businesses. Local businesses really need your love and your support. 
Um, someone says, do any of the nurseries you listed specialize in fruit trees? Yes. Actually, one that I did not add um, that I forgot to add but is awesome is A Natural Farm. A Natural Farm is in Howie in the Hills, which is um, a little bit west of Orlando. Um, their fruit tree varieties and um, uh, different choices are amazing. They have so much and they really are experts. So it's called A Natural Farm. So check them out. And they specialize in tropical fruit trees, tropical and subtropical, tropical, I believe. The next thing is companion planting. So like I said, some plants just go well together. There's um, a lot of different information online. Just as a good um, rule of thumb for myself, I always look up the plant that I'm trying to grow and try to see what the good companions and the bad companions are. Um, I'll take anything I can get to try to get a better crop. So um, I would encourage you to look this up. You can just Google it, um, companion planting tomatoes, companion planting eggplant, whatever your desired main crop is. Um, an example of this is um, potatoes and tomatoes are not companions because um, they require a lot of water, they require a lot of nutrients, and when they're planted together, they can kind of compete for that into the soil. Um, whenever you look underneath the soil, you'll, you would be able to see that too because the um, tomato roots go really deep and wide um, and thick, and uh, the potatoes um, you know, they're creating the storage organs, which is the potato, and um, they need a lot of space and water to, and nutrients to be able to do that. So companion planting, look into it. Um, we also have different classes with fleet farming on companion planting, talking about more specifics if you're interested. I have a book at the end on it as well. I just wanted to share a garden uh, design that I thought was really cool. One of them is, um, so growing your tomatoes. This is a sweet 100 tomato in the middle. Sweet 100, They're, um, it's purchased from Johnny Seeds. Um, a regional seed supplier is Baker Crete Seeds. Um, it's rareseeds.com if you wanna check that out. But planting your tomatoes, planting your peas next to them. This is a sugar snap pea on the um, left-hand side. These are great for kids. If kids don't really like green things, I bet you anything, you can convince them to eat these. Um, they're really great in the garden and um, easy to grow. They add nitrogen to the soil of the um, tomatoes. Next to it, you can put a basil. Um, we sell and have a lot of um, uh, African blue basil. Um, we've learned that it's a really hardy plant variety. Some of the more Italian basils can be a little harder to grow, but still possible. But basil is a good companion tomato, as, as we learned, and dill. So dill invites the pollinators as well as the basil um, to your garden. They'll invite the parasitic wasp that helps to um, attack the uh, tomato hornworm that might be uh, um, trying to eat all of your tomatoes. So creating an ecosystem and, and thinking about having herbs and flowers and different things in your garden living together is a good idea. And you can do these types of systems in pots. You can have these plants in separate pots next to each other too. And you know the pollinators will still come and still be a part of the system and creating that together. So fruit trees, I have to mention, I do have a favorite fruit tree. Um, my favorite fruit tree is a mulberry. You'll see that in the um, picture on the left hand side. Mulberries are kind of like blackberries, but they're a little bit longer and um, they have a different uh, a different flavor really. But mulberries are great because they are from um, Florida and actually the east coast of um, the United States. And um, they grow very well. You can propagate them, which I'll get into, um, from cutting very well, which means that you can take um, a branch of this and try to root it yourself and grow a new tree. Um, there's different varieties. There's the white mulberry, the black mulberry, and the red mulberry. Um, and all are, all are great. Um, they'll get really tall, though. That's something that um, I, I like them because they can get tall enough to climb. But um, you might want to reconsider if you have a very small yard. Other things that grow well, and mind you, um, there's different varieties of each plant, um, are mangoes, papayas, bananas, um, Barbados cherries, Suriname cherries, Florida peaches, loquats. Um, and all of these, I believe all of these are um, uh, sold at A Natural Farm in Howie in the Hills. 
So that is a nursery that I know for sure. Um, but I would check out the other nurseries um, to see if they sell these as well. Bananas, I feel like every Florida garden should have a banana somewhere. They really like compost. They really like, um, in my garden, it responds well to um, a watery area that I have. And um, so I would suggest that you have a banana on site whenever they fruit. It is seriously so much fruit and it's really exciting whenever you start to get um, you start to see that male flower on the plant. You start to see the bananas grow, then ripen over time. Um, it makes you feel like you're a really good gardener. <laughs> um, but fruit trees in general, you know, as long as you water them in, you plant them properly. Um, you're going to have a fruiting um, crop at some point if they have enough sunlight and water, nutrients, etc. So fruit trees. Florida peaches also. Um, I actually toured a site um, in Claremont, I believe, and they were growing peaches, um, a certain type of Florida peach, in response to having a lot of problems with citrus. So the citrus greening that was um, running rampant that's still affecting our state and um, affecting the orange crops, um, growers were starting to think about different crops to kind of shift to. And uh, I know peaches and blueberries were one of them. So here's some seed resources that um, I have. I have um, three different types. Um, Johnny Seeds is awesome because they are just, their quality of seed is amazing. It really is. I think it's the best seed company in the state when it comes to like quality and price and all that. Um, Baker Creek's Heirloom Seed Company is a great regional option. I think um, they're on the east coast of the United States and um, they have a lot of great um, rare seeds. Um, their website is actually called rareseeds.com. And if you can't find those, I would say go with an organic heirloom non-GMO seed type, um, you know, you can really grow whatever you want, but I would say that um, organic seeds are um, a higher quality seed. And um, I like um, the non-GMO just because I feel like I can trust it more. Heirloom, um, you usually think of things like tomatoes, like heirloom tomatoes. Um, that's also a great thing to look out for as well. With seeds, um, I teach my kids that I um, teach through my classes, plant them three times as deep as they are long. So, you know, sometimes a kid will have a tiny, tiny, tiny seed and they'll put the biggest hole in the garden and put that seed in the bottom of that hole. And you know, there's no way that plant can fight its way all the way to the top of the soil. So it's a good thing to think about like that. If you have seeds that are super, super tiny, you might just want to sprinkle them on top of the soil and then sprinkle a little bit of soil on top. Um, if you have larger seeds, then, you know, three times as deep is a good motto. Um, checking the moisture of your garden, um, avoiding watering the garden in the hottest part of the day. So when it's really hot, you might see your plants start to kind of like wilt a little bit, but um, it's actually not that good for them to be watered at this time because they're, they may be sending energy to their roots to try to um, expand their root system. So waiting until like maybe the earlier or the later part of the day so then they can still kind of dry out a little bit before um, nighttime. Um, and also storing your seeds in a cool place. There's been so many times um, in my learning of growing food where I've left seeds out for periods of time on my really hot porch. And that's not really good for the seeds um, storing wise, right? Because we have a lot of humidity in the air. And um, so I would suggest to keep your seeds inside um, I don't know about keeping it in the refrigerator. If someone has a good idea on that, I'd love to hear it. But I think inside of our homes is a good temperature in a cool, dark place. So then you know that you have a better chance of having these seeds actually sprout and actually um, produce fruit, food. Um, and if you have any questions, please um, comment them below. And maintenance. Gardening is a verb. So sometimes, you know, we'll plant a garden and people will be, um, you know, not understanding why their plants aren't doing well. Well, it's a thing that um, with some crops, mind you, the fruit trees and maybe perennial plants like the perennial spinaches means that they grow all year long. Those things can kind of, you know, last on their own a little bit longer than maybe something like your tomatoes or um, your peppers or your eggplants that you might want to be checking on. Um, but gardening is a verb. Removing um, plants that you don't want in your garden, making sure that the soil it has a great moisture to it. Maybe you'll add a little bit of mulch to the garden. Ooh, maybe it's a it's a Friday night and you want to get crazy and add some um, worm castings, and you can add sprinkle those into the garden. And it can um, be a, something that is part of your lifestyle instead of just being something that you know you do once a month and um, check in on. But think about native landscaping. 
Think about pollinator gardening as well. This requires a little bit less attention because you're just making sure that it has the right amount of water and making sure that these plants are kind of assimilating into your yard, into your landscape well. So that can be um, a little bit of a time saver um, if you don't have as much time in your garden. Um, if someone is really, really, you know, not doing good with gardening, I would give them a succulent and call it a day. <laughs> Um, but no, really, there are so many edible plants and it doesn't mean that, you know, um, if one crop doesn't work for you, that you're a bad gardener because that's not true. It means that maybe there's another crop that is more for your time that you can commit to the garden and for your lifestyle. And so a little bit more about maintenance. Um, a cool tool that I um, have found is on the left-hand side, this is called a scuffle hoe. So if you are um, older or if you have any back problems and you don't wanna be getting up and down in the garden all the time, but you need to do some weeding, um, it has a, it's kind of like a horseshoe um, on the bottom and it has a, a serrated edge. So you can stand and weed your garden with a scuffle hoe at the same time. They're also called action hoes. I know that Ace Hardware has them. And so this is great for weeding your garden. Um, I've also put neem oil here. Um, you know, a lot of people have different perspectives on how to prevent the pests from coming to your garden. Um, we have a video also on fleetfarming.org slash garden resources, all about um, natural integrated pest management. So if you wanna learn more about that. But neem oil seems to be a safe bet. Um, neem oil is uh, derived from the neem tree. It's just an oil that makes kind of like a slippery surface on your plants. Um, you buy it in a concentrate and you dilute it with water and you put that on your plants and it can prevent um, insects from coming to your plants that you don't really want. Um, also, I've heard of like um, uh, ivory dish soap, I believe, and water, mixing that together to create that slippery surface. So there's a couple different ways that you can do that. Um, but I would watch that video and learn about the insects, learn about the names of the insects, what they like, what they don't like. So then you can kind of deal with that a little bit better. Um, and then again, with the mulching and comp, um, the cardboard and mulching, um, that seems to be a good solution. If you're really struggling with weeds in certain areas, you might want to just do that so you can focus on your raised beds or focus on your pollinator gardens and not so much worrying about um, maybe some types of grasses infiltrating your garden. Um, I have a question. Do you have a natural solution for aphids on tomatoes? I don't, but we do have um, in that video on sleepfarming.org slash garden resources. We do have a, a video with a insect expert. So I think that's called an um, entomologist, I believe. So he's an entomologist and he knows about that. So I would watch that video, um, aphids on tomatoes. Um, and the next question is, does it mean harm bees? I'm not quite sure about that. Um, I'm not quite sure. I'm, I think that neem is one of the more natural uh, varieties of pest deterrents than, um, you know, the other harsher chemicals. But um, that is something that if anybody has any ideas about, I'd love to hear that and um, ask my entomologist friend about that, too. I'm, I haven't heard that. Um, and yeah, so this is a little bit about the maintenance of the garden. And harvesting. So harvesting is the most rewarding, one of the most rewarding parts of your garden. If you're growing your greens and your lettuces for the fall, um, it's good to remove the leaves on the outer side of the plant um, rather than the middle because the outer leaves are the older leaves. The new growth is coming from the middle. So you can harvest those um, outer skirt um, uh, leaves. So then you can keep the um, apical meristem or the middle of the plant growing and pushing out that life from the center. With carrots, we just like to move the soil from the top and check the size of the carrots. And whenever they're the diameter that we're looking for, just pull them out. Um, also with uh, uh, watermelon, watermelon has a tendril. You'll see the green and um, springy tendrils on there. Um, and what I've been told is when they, when they die all the way back to the vine, um, this tendril will be right near the, where the fruit is. When that dies and becomes brown all the way back, that's when you know it's time to harvest your, your watermelon. Also, when you um, tap on it, it will have kind of like a hollow, um, deep sound. And with bananas, you can actually let them um, ripen on the, on the tree or on the plant because it's not a tree, it's an herbaceous plant. Um, or you can cut it and hang it um, from somewhere in your house or your garage and let it um, ripen all the way down. It will start with a couple fruit and then it will start to spread um, as it moves down the plant. 
And the last thing is a little bit about edible flowers and flowers in general. Um, zinnias are this um, pink flower in the top right hand corner. They do really well in Florida that has poor soil and not a lot of water. Zinnias um, grow pretty well in that kind of environment. Of course, plants would love more nutrients if they can get it. Um, but zinnias seem to be a good one for the summer in Florida, maybe maybe late summer. Um, a good flower grower is called Farm, um, farm Gal Flowers. She grows a bunch of different um, flower varieties. She's kind of like the, the flower expert in Orlando. And I know she likes to grow dahlias. I've seen her grow zinnias before. And she has some raised beds at um, East End Market, if you want to check out that too. And so she is the flower expert. She knows more about that. Um, but one that I really like is nasturtium. Nasturtium is in the middle. And the nasturtium flowers are edible. They're a little bit spicy. And now in the year is the time to grow your nasturtium. Nasturtium, and you'll see it, the word on here too. It's kind of a new word for some people. And um, you can buy this from Johnny's or Baker Seeds. And um, it creates these little lily pads that I he have heard are edible too, but I don't really think they taste that great. Um, the flowers taste good though. They are spicy. And um, they will sprawl out, which means they'll kind of like crawl against the ground or the earth and um, provide these beautiful flowers that pollinators like as well. And then I have my other favorites, dill and marigolds. Dill and marigolds, very easy to grow, um, loved by other plants typically, and um, loved by the pollinators as well. So um, really quickly, this could be a whole class, but plant propagation is a thing. Um, if you have that friend that when they go to someone's garden and they like something, they'll take a branch or they'll take a cutting and you're like, what is this person doing? They're doing a science called plant propagation, which is basically a, a method of cloning. You're taking one part of a plant and helping it to grow roots and to be propagated into a new plant, which is an identical copy of that plant. And um, so a, a couple of ways that you could do this, you could do this through water. Um, I have a class on growing food from food waste, where you can learn about um, growing those roots um, from vegetables that you get from the store. Mind you, you're not going to get a garden, a, a garden's harvest of these vegetables, but it's a fun experiment to try to grow new plants and to have a little bit of food produced. Um, kids really like this because it's a, a fun little experiment. You can also change out the water every couple of days um, and watch the plants grow in like a windowsill because they'll have enough um, of the uh, warmth and the sunlight from the um, window and the water to be able to help them to grow. Um, but some plants that can be propagated, what we call by cutting, is things like um, basil, mulberry, are Cuban oregano, cranberry hibiscus, um, thyme, and milkweed. Um, you can grow your own transplants at home. Um, there's different methods of doing that. We have a free gardening guide on our website um, at fleetfarming.org slash uh, edible landscapes. There's some books that I would suggest that you read. Um, Robert Bowden, shout out to him. He um, is the garden director at Lou Gardens. He wrote Florida Fruit and Vegetable Gardening. The Urban Farmer, who is our inspiration and also Carrots Love Tomatoes, all about companion planting. Um, awesome YouTubers, um, uh, Epic Gardening, The Urban Farmer, and Growing Your Greens. This will get you hyped to get your garden growing um, this fall. There's different clubs in the areas. Orlando Permaculture, as mentioned. There's the Central Florida Fruit Society, also great if you like fruit. Um, for urban agriculture, there's us. There's also um, Ever Oak Farms and um, Winter Park Urban Farms. Um, for native plants, there's Florida Native Plant Society Couplet Fern Chapter, which is the local one in the area. If you want to get a degree in plant science, Valencia College is amazing. I went through their program and I got my job with sleep farming. So if you're interested in growing through that, definitely, definitely check out Valencia College's plant science program. Um, and if you want to come weed my garden, you are totally welcome to do that. And I will share my information, which is a joke for me. Um, we have swarm rides where we invite people out to come and farm with us on bikes. Um, you can check that out on our Facebook um, that was shared. Um, our Facebook has on the left hand side events and you can check that to see um, an event where you can come out uh, and um, farm with us and learn about growing food hands on for free. The Ideas Hive, so I mentioned earlier the environmental events um, that we host every month. We have one coming up on October 7th. So if you want to check out Ideas for Us Orlando, you can check out The Hive. This is going to be a really, really awesome one about electing climate solutions.
Follow us on social media. We have a, a website and a YouTube for fleet farming and ideas. We have tons of videos, tons of resources. We really want to be a, a, a resource to our community. Um, so check us out also on Instagram. And yeah, Edible Landscapes. If you would like us to come and build a garden for you, um, reach out to fleetfarming.org and we would love to set up a raised bed for you, food forest, fruit trees, ed maintenance, education, you name it. And we serve the greater Orlando area. So thank you so much. I finished just in the nick of time. Thank you, Josh, for having me. Thank you, everybody, for asking any more questions. Um, I kind of answered the questions during the conversation, but if you have any other ones, please put them in the comments. Um, but thank you so much. That was awesome, Caroline. Thank you so much for coming out tonight, or I guess staying in tonight, but presenting with all of us here. It was it was uh, really great. I love the ideas, and I'm just uh, yeah, it just always inspires me hearing about this. So I gotta go home and uh, and tend to my garden. <laughs> yeah, right outside. Yeah, waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you guys. Thank you so much for coming, and uh, thank you all for attending. Um, I had a, a great time. Learned a lot. Um, and I, yeah, that was just, that's just awesome. And, uh, if you guys are into this, get involved with, uh, fleet farming. They have some really cool stuff. Check out the storm rides. Uh, and then the ideas hive is a really fantastic, uh, just like one night a month. Is it second Wednesdays? Um, or is it, I might have uh, to check that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, also check out ideas hive. It's a really, really inspiring time. If you felt inspired by this at all, uh, you can hear about so many more things. Mm -hmm. They talk about gardening. There's so many gardeners there, but then there's also people who are just wanting to take action in the community. So it's a really great thing. Um, and yeah, please, um, if you like this event, want to see more like it, check out that survey as well. We're happy to hear from you and we want to learn from you guys as well. Um, and we want to learn what we can bring in to you. So um, thank you so much, Caroline. And uh, thank you all for attending. I, I hope you guys have a, uh, a great night. Happy growing. <laughs> Be going, everyone. Bye, guys. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to be the first to find out when we have new fun and informative videos for you. Orange County Library System is your place to learn, grow, connect.